Welcome to Old Path and our study through the Old Testament. We uh, complete the book of 2 Chronicles today. Um, chapter 36 is one of those chapters, if I know I kind of say it, I hope it's not offensive to anybody, but if you consider yourself, as I do myself, kind of Bible geeky about things, and, you, and you, when you go through history and you find a lot of interesting dots being connected, that kind of thing, if that really excites you, Chapter 36, probably verse for verse, has some of the most amazing things said about it and two very big revelations uh, that you get from it. Um, but I, I find them to be incredibly fascinating um, for a variety of reasons. The, not only the, the things that are said expressly, but a couple of the things that are implied are really, really interesting to me. So. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of references, and uh, there's going to be some passages that we're going to go that are related to this that uh, kind of help us work through some of these, these passages and uh, the implications of it that are you know kind of down the road. So before we actually look at the text, let's just do a couple of reminder things, really, really important. Um, we want to remember that at this, in this part of the history of uh, Judah, Remember, we have just completed the, uh, the life of Josiah. And as far as the kings of Judah, forget about the kings of Israel. There was never a decent one of those. But as far as the kings of Judah are concerned, David, of course, has a tremendous amount of notoriety. And the kingdom was in great shape when he took over as the king, for the most part. And it certainly was in great shape when he handed it off to Solomon. Um, when Josiah takes it over... The, the kingdom is in a real, real bad situation, and it really begins to see incredible change under his time. But again, re being reminded of this, it took quite a while into his kingly reign until things began to correct. But if you've been studying through this with us, you'll know over the last couple of weeks, there is the idea that God has already pronounced judgment because he knows exactly what's going to happen in the, the succession of kings after his time and um, that God was going to have to follow through with the, the promise of judgment because of the wickedness of the people. It had a respite and God stayed his hand during the time of Josiah very simply because Josiah's heart was in the right place. I want you to notice when we get into this how quickly it takes or how quickly it, things go from a place of what they're supposed to be to how they can become um, just really in the place of, of complete rejection of God and how fast things will completely reverse. And so it's very, very important for everybody to realize when it comes to spiritual matters, it is not something that you, you can rely on what happened yesterday. It's why our, in, in modern times, as Christians, we call it our walk with God. And that, in, you know, that just implies that there's progress going forward. What we saw, that really was happening quite a bit with Josiah. Uh, as soon as he was dead, they started walking, but in the opposite direction. And they really, really did everything that they could almost immediately in the succession of kings to do the complete opposite of what Josiah was doing. So there was just really no way out of this. It was going to end very, very poorly. We are going to end this chapter by dealing with the Babylonian captivity, the last of the kings of Judah, and then the return from the time of their exile, actually by the time that the Babylonians had been conquered by the Persians. Cyrus is mentioned here by name, and Cyrus was also mentioned by Isaiah, and I'll give you the references for that. In fact, we'll read one of them. But um, we want to remember that what we're covering here is a, a great deal of time, and roughly about 20 years, let's just call it a little over 20 years, roughly, um, from the time that Josiah dies to the time that they're really taken away in the end of the Babylonian captivity, or the beginning, I, I'm sorry, uh, the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. But you're going to find that there is, um, before the, the Babylonians could come in, there was problems already at the hands of, of the Egyptians. So what a weird full circle thing this is, that uh, they had been delivered out of the hands of the, uh, of the Egyptians, and they were led out by Moses, who, who through him, uh, they brought them all the way to the land. God brought them all the way to the land. Moses dies before they can get into the promised land. And uh, so, of course, it's Joshua who leads them in, ultimately. And so they've been in the land for hundreds of years, only to, at the end of the last of the two kingdoms, 
uh, Judah is now having to answer to Egypt. Ultimately, they will have to answer to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, only to be restored back into the land uh, in the time of the Persians. And not because of the Persians, but because God had desired to bring them back. So this is, um, again, one of those chapters we get so much information here. There is so much that is of great importance for us to understand. And so I um, want to make sure that we take our time to go through this. So let's turn to uh, 2 Chronicles. We're in chapter 36, <coughs> the last of, of the chapters, of course. And it is, it is so fascinating. There is so much important history Jeremiah is the prominent um, uh, prophet at the time, and uh, when you read through Jeremiah's uh, uh, writing in his book, you find that this part of the history dominates so much of it from the chapters basically 20 into the 20s, and then uh, it really kind of follows throughout all the way up to the Babylonian captivity and then so much more even after that. So it is a, a really fascinating book. Jeremiah was there during these times. Um, he was there during the time of Josiah all the way up through the time when they're displaced from the land and then he ends up leaving uh, out, of, um, out of Israel entirely uh, to escape what's happening with the Babylonians. So really amazing all of the history that is, is spoken of here. One last thing just so that you can, uh, it's going to be very obvious when you read through it. This shows that this was written post-exile. So it has chronicled the history of the kings, which obviously meant if you're going to be able to speak about the last king in, in the succession, it clearly had to have been written after. But let's remember that it's going to be 100 plus years from the time that they begin to come back into the land until the time when this could be written um, because uh, Cyrus is mentioned. And so it's well into the time of probably Ezra. Um, Nehemiah, all of that, which is again the next book that we'll get into is the book of Ezra. So what we're reading about is a history of the nation and since they're mentioning the, um, uh, the, the King Cyrus, remember that's at the beginning of them coming back through Zerubbabel. So it is, uh, the history of this is written at minimum 70 plus years after the fall of Judah, because they were in uh, their, their captivity from Babylon to Persia for 70 years. We know the exact number of those years, and this book, uh, this chapter rather, explains to us why that is. So what we're reading in, in Chronicles has to be at minimum 70 years post-exile. So when it first started and Nebuchadnezzar first took them. So that gives you an idea when this would have been written historically. I, I would uh, su uh, suppose it's probably written quite a bit even after that. Many um, uh, think that possibly the, the, um, uh, the author here is Ezra himself. So anyhow, with all that said, it's again, it's speculation. It's not anything of, of huge importance, but we do need to realize it was written quite a bit after the fact. That's why the history is, of course, so accurate. And it mentions, again, Cyrus uh, as being the one who ended up sending him back. We will, like I say, take a look at, uh, at Isaiah prophesying about this person, Cyrus, about 200 years before the event. So when, uh, when Isaiah spoke of him and God showed him that it would end up being this King Cyrus, um, he was spoken about before he was born. So God's telling them the history before it takes place. So chapter 36, let's turn there. And uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll take a look at our text. Father, we thank you as we take this time to look into your word. We pray that you would uh, speak to us and, and open our eyes and our understanding and our minds to what we read here. And God, may you be glorified in our lives, and may we learn the, the important parts from this history and to all that the implication, everything that is there, knowing that you see the end from the beginning and there's nothing that you cannot tell in advance because you see it all at the same time. And so may we understand you in those terms that when you make promises and you say that you will do things, we have no problems believing that you will because they're already accomplished in your mind. And we just are the ones here as it's playing out in linear time. We pray, God, that you would, again, give us understanding and, and uh, willing hearts to receive what you would show us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Okay, chapter 36, it says, Then the people of the land, and this is after, of course, uh, Josiah has died. So the people of the land, they took Jehoahaz, and uh, he is the son of Josiah. They made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. 
Now Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king and he reigned for three months, so not much. Now what happened there is that the king of Egypt deposed him at Jerusalem and imposed on the land a tribute, 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. So the king of Pharaoh made Jehoahaz's brother Eliakim the king over Judah and Jerusalem and changed his name to Jehoiakim. And uh, Necho took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him off to Egypt. So this is the beginning of two of these types of things where foreign governments are now able to do this because God's hand is no longer on them. And this is exactly what God said would take place. So shouldn't be any big surprise here. This wouldn't have, I'm sure of it, this would not have happened. Well, God said it wouldn't. This would not have happened under Josiah. It is now happening under his kids after him, and it's only taking a matter of months. So I want to make sure that that, that really should kind of sear into our mind that had it not been for the swift reaction, I guess you could say, of uh, Josiah when he first realized just how bad things were, um, if it wasn't for his reaction, when he knew what, what kind of a very desperate situation the nation was in and when they found the book of the law, this all would have happened under Josiah. Instead, Josiah does what's right and honorable, and it literally stays the hand of God of judgment. And now what we have here is this is all going to be taking place. Let's remember something. Uh, not only Jeremiah, but also Zephaniah are a couple of prophets who are prophesying at this time. So it's not as though... Uh, Josiah dies and then everybody's waiting around to see what's going to happen. They've already been told everything that needs to be known by Jeremiah, Zephaniah, who knows what other prophets may have actually had uh, hands in this. We know that God sent people to the, the, the kings. That's told to us in this chapter. So let's remember that when these kings hit the ground running, if you will, after the death of Josiah, these, men's, these men had already purposed in their heart that theirs was going to be a life of rebellion and wickedness against God and to do all of the abominations that had been done before Josiah became the king. So it's as though you can say God was ready to do all of this, and then Josiah comes onto the scene repents of him for himself personally and then leads the nation the way that they should be led as soon as he's dead then his sons pick up from not where he left off but go in the totally opposite direction and god says my hand is back in the place of judgment and it happens immediately so we see then in, in verse four what ends up happening so now you have foreign leaders putting in their own people their own hand-picked people the person who rebels against them is taken away and then their hand-picked guy. So we can't even say that this is the succession of the kings. These are now nothing more than kings that serve as vassals of foreign, uh, foreign governments. So once again, the children of Israel, the, the people of God, are now being dictated to by foreign governments of who is going to do what in the nation. That tells you just how desperate the situation is and how far they had fallen. So we read in verse 5, Now Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up uh, against him and bound him in bronze fetters, carried him off to Babylon. This would be, of course, the first of the, um, the times that Nebuchadnezzar was going to come and do the things that he did, the sieges that took place. There was from the first to the last about 19 years of the Babylonians coming from the first time that they came onto the scene. And remember, this is covering quite a bit of time. Um, Egypt is kind of on the way out. They're not the world power. Babylon is now coming on to that place. And so this is a transition of world powers. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up against him and uh, bound him in bronze fetters, carried him off to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar then also carried off some of the articles from the house of the Lord, uh, to Babylon and put them in his temple in Babylon. And so there they would remain. We know that some of those things were taken even from Babylon into Persia, because remember during uh, Daniel's time, what are, uh, it's Belshazzar does what he does, and there's some of the implements from the, the house of God and that whole thing, if you remember that whole story, uh, that writing on the wall, meeny, meeny, tekel, you farsim, um, that you've been weighed and found wanting. So this is just 
It shows what happens when God says, I will keep your enemies at bay until such time as you rebel against me. And then his way of saying you're on your own at that point. Now, important part of this. There's, a, a, again, a real important transition that takes place. And in verse 8, it says, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim, the abominations which he did, and what was found against him, indeed, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah. And then Jehoiachin, the son, uh, his son, reigned in his place. Now, just so you know, um, the parallels to this, my grandson's downstairs screaming and yelling, sorry, if you heard that. <laughs> um, 2 Kings chapter 23 uh, is when you start to find the, uh, the transition from Josiah. Chapter 23 will have uh, the, the information about Josiah, but then you'll see this transition. It's a little more expanded there. Um, the, uh, the writer of Chronicles is not necessarily going to concern himself greatly, but this is where you can find that he starts to make this, this pact with Pharaoh when, when now it's Nebuchadnezzar that's creating the problems. And yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting read. It runs through chapters 24 and uh, into 25. So there is, again, transition. You can look up these names as you go through them. But these are just, again, the descendants, the people that come right after Josiah. And so it says uh, in verse 10, At the turn uh, of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar summoned him and uh, took him to Babylon with the costly articles from the house of the Lord. And then he made Zedekiah, Jehoiakim's brother, the king over Jerusalem. And uh, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he uh, became king, and he reigned uh, 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear an oath by God, and he st but he stiffened his neck, hardened his heart uh, against turning to the Lord God of Israel. So... This gives us the last of these kings. Now, I, I kind of read through that pretty quick because it's it's important history, <clears throat> but it's the stuff that Jeremiah had to say that we really need to pay good attention to because there are some very, very important things that take place from this point on. So it's a pretty rapid succession, roughly only 20 years or so, a little bit more, after Josiah's death to the end of these kings and that's all that it took. That's not even a generation. And it, it went from a place that, that the nation was at rest, the people were following the Lord as they should, and the king, in that case Josiah, was doing as he should, walking honorably before God, and the nation was being blessed. So no sooner is he gone than his sons and his sons' sons become these wicked rulers, some of them just put in from foreign, foreign leaders, and now they're, they're just basically doing the bidding of foreign nations at this point in, a, in less than a generation. So that degradation happens instantaneously. God just removes his hand as far as the protection is concerned, but it doesn't mean that he's not still trying to reach out to them. But he is still in that place of needing to, um, there's chastisement that's coming. And, J and Jeremiah has had a lot to say to them by this point. And those are the things that I'd really like to take uh, some time to look at now because they're very, very important uh, to the story. So let's turn to the book of Jeremiah and let's start at chapter 21. I won't need to do a lot in the way of uh, um, commentary on this. I'll stop along the way just a little bit, but we'll let the text kind of speak for itself because it says some very, very important things. So what I'm going to do is kind of read these if, if you um, are okay with it. I'll just read them in succession. And you'll notice what is taking place by the time that he gets to Jehoiachin. And uh, for it, important that he's the one who's singled out here, but it, it really is an important matter all the way up to the birth of Jesus. And that's why I, I, I'm so fascinated by this. This is one of those two things where the prophetic things that we learn about here have implications far down the road. So in this case, <clears throat> in chapter 21, verses 1 through 10, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah 
uh, sent to uh, him Pasher, the son of uh, Melchiah, and uh, Zephaniah, the son of uh, Messiah, the priest, saying, Please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wondrous works that the king may go away from us. So isn't this a weird thing? And we probably have witnessed this in our own time. It's not as though there's, there's no understanding about what God is capable of doing. But what they don't realize is that God, as they're appealing to him, desires them to do so and to understand him on a personal level. So here Zedekiah realizes we've got a serious problem because here comes Nebuchadnezzar. What this shows you is that he has a head knowledge that, let's go to, to Jeremiah, maybe God will pull one out for us like he's done so many times before. But what he fails to understand is that the God that they're trying to see will, who may come to their, their aid is one that they have no intention of knowing and they have distanced themselves from him intentionally. So the idea is, let's see if we can you know, get somebody to, to plead our case for us, but they won't do it for themselves. So Zedekiah has no desire, like Josiah did, to hear the things that, that are going wrong and take some responsibility for it. This is what happens, and we get it from time to time. I'm sure many of you, as you're hearing me, know this to be true. You will have people come to you because they know who you are, they know what you're about, and when something calamitous happens, though they themselves don't believe as you do, they'll ask you to pray for them because they know that maybe just throw spaghetti against the wall and hopefully something will stick. So they come and ask us and pray. Well, this is kind of the same thing that Zedekiah is doing here. So Jeremiah said to them, thus you will say to Zedekiah. So he sends his messengers, Zedekiah does. And Jeremiah says, you go back and you tell him this. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands which, uh, with which you fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans, who besiege you outside the walls, and I will assemble them uh, in the midst of the city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike the inhabitants of this city, both men and beast." They will die of great pestilence, uh, of a great pestilence. And afterward, which is what happens during a siege, and afterwards, says the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his servants and the people, and such as are left in the city from the pestilence and the sword and from famine into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life, and they will strike them with the edge of the sword he will, he will not spare them, or will he have pity on them? And all of this could have been avoided. Now, you will say uh, to the people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I have set before you the way of life and of death. And he who remains in this city will die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. But he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who besiege you, I, uh, you uh, that person shall live, or he shall live. His life will be a prize to him, for I have set my face against this city for adversity and not for good, says the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it with fire. Now, as we're going to see, there are a few reasons for this. So, there are things that have been festering for a long time with, with which God wants to deal with the nation. But he also has a king who is playing games with him, trying to see if God will bail them out, though he has no desire whatsoever to have anything to do with God. So he comes with his hat in his hand, if you will, by his messengers, and they say to Jeremiah, find out what the Lord will do. Maybe he'll deliver us. And he says, let me tell you what he had to say. And this is what they say. Now, this would be a great time for Zedekiah to say, I had no idea. What do I have to do on the personal level? He could have done all of that. Of course, he didn't, so when God makes this judgment, he already knows what Zedekiah's answer is. He knows the condition of his heart. He knows that he will not do this. So God can say without any equivocation, he's going away and that this place is going to be judged. But notice even in the midst of this, he gives them the option. 
if you will go out and surrender yourself to the Chaldeans, because I'm sending you into a captivity, for, and the reasons will become plain to them, if you will go out there, at least you will be spared from being killed. Problem is you're going to go into a captivity and a slavery as well. So, interesting. Now, from there, um, let's go to chapter uh, 22. And he goes on. <clears throat> this is where he's making a, a set of announcements to these kings. And though the person that's now being spoken of is a king from before, this is a prophecy about him. And it has implication all the way down to Jesus. And we'll, we'll tie up those loose ends because they are fascinating. And so he says um, in verse 24, As I live, says the Lord, through Co though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I will pluck it off. Now he's referred to here as Coniah. Uh, if you look in First um, Chronicles 3, in the genealogies that are there, he is referred to as Jeconiah. We just read about him a little bit earlier. He's also referred to as Jehoiachin. Same guy, three different names. It's just basic variations of pretty much the same, the same guy. Um, little slight differences in the meanings of the name. So he says, I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life, into the hand of those who face you, uh, face uh, whose face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, into the hand of the Chaldeans. So I will cast you out, your mother who bore you, into another country where you were not born, and there you will die. But to this land to which they have desired to return, they shall not return. So that means that the people who go into this captivity are not going to be the ones who will return to see it. They're going to die in that captivity. So God says this, Is this man, Kaniah, despised, a broken idol, a vessel in which there is no pleasure? Why are you cast out, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they did not know? Now, the, the answer to that is obvious because of their rebellion. So it says, verse 30, So says the Lord, Write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. That is a big time matter. Now, why is that? So when it says, count him as childless, um, it is as though he has no heirs, yet he had, I believe, seven sons, if not mistaken, something like that. But he had a number of sons. So for God to pronounce a judgment about him and say, let him go down as childless, none of his descendants will rule, then he mentions that as the line of David. It means that basically God is cursing that line. And it just means, as far as God looks at that line, there is nothing in that line that is of any importance to him. They are meaningless in any of the promises going forward that God has given. This becomes an issue. Because David was told when it came to Solomon that there would be a forever king that would come from, the, from David's line, and it could have come through Solomon. But let's, let's understand this. This Coniah, Jeconiah, Jehoiachin, same guy, whatever name you want to use, is now being pronounced as barren from his time on, meaning that promise of the forever king could not come through his line, and he is a direct descendant of Solomon. So then what is to be done with this? Because if you're not seeing the problem with this, God said that there would be a forever king coming through David's line. The promise could have come through Solomon. But that would have been problematic for a couple of reasons. First of all, this line is cursed. Second of all, that line comes down to Joseph. Joseph was not Jesus' father in the biological sense. He had no DNA, if you will, from Joseph. Joseph was simply the man who was married to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is who, uh, who um, developed, however, how, you know, we, we try to think of how it is, but the, the physical form that Jesus held was created supernaturally. Jesus always had existed, always has, always will, but he took on a body of flesh and blood, but it could not come through regular physical human means because Joseph would have been the father and Joseph had a cursed bloodline. How do we know that? We know it because of a couple of genealogies. The first one mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. Let's take a look. 
So in Matthew's gospel, the genealogy is on the front end, and it's right up at the beginning of this. So the, the genealogy here is written from the oldest to the newest, and it begins with Abraham. Now, it doesn't go back any earlier than that, but we're dealing with the establishment of the nation and the promise of the children of Israel, sons of Jacob, and ultimately the tribe of Judah is the important part of this. So notice, and it goes uh, in verse, it says, Now Abraham begat Isaac, and it starts to go down through the, the names in the genealogies. Look at what you get when you get to verse 11. So Josiah, who we just studied about, he begat Jeconiah. That's the guy who's cursed. And his brothers about the time that they were carried away to Babylon. So when we take this genealogy and we match it up with the promise that Jeremiah had said, as far as Jeconiah is concerned, he will have nothing in the way of any inheritance that goes on. Jeremiah has made that abundantly clear. So again, God cannot contradict himself, so there must be some kind of a way to remedy this problem. The bloodline that Jesus would have through Joseph, even if it's by adoption or whatever you want to say, I don't care how you try to work it out, it's cursed. It cannot be. God would not recognize that bloodline. But it's got to be a descendant of David and Jesse. Has to be. Could have been Solomon, but now we know why it wasn't. So what is the alternative? Luke chapter 3. Let's go there. Luke chapter 3 gives us another genealogy. And in this case, it goes from the newest to the oldest. And it picks up at um, verse 31. Let's get there. Um, 3, 31, um, you know, let's get, uh, let's get to 30, okay, 30, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of, uh, Jonan, uh, the son of Eliakim, the son of Melia, the son of Manan, the son of, uh, Mathena, the son of Nathan, who is the son of David. David was the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz. Yes, that Boaz. And so when you start to work through that, the line that is clean, and it, that genealogy begins at, um, the uh, it, it starts at verse 23. And Jesus is still known as the son of Joseph because that would be the culture. But what we're looking at here is more the genealogy through Mary, not through Joseph. So Jesus is, is referred to as the son of Joseph, as he would have been considered that. You don't mention the woman as she, he's the son of the woman for genealogy's sake. It's from the father. But when you start to look through this, it is actually Mary's genealogy. So different family line, though there are some similarities to it. Because um, obviously, especially as far as David is concerned, that's a common ancestry. Nathan is the issue. Nathan is the son of David. And so that you have a clean line through him where there is no curse. He's not of that same line from Solomon through the kings. Nathan was not a king, but Nathan was a son of David. So hopefully I've made that understandable. If there's any questions about that, of course, you can contact me through the, uh, the ministry website. Um, I'll go ahead and give that to you now. The uh, email is um, at the ministry website, which is oldpaththeology.net. And uh, you can email me through there if you need these references. I know I'm going through them kind of fast. So we get from uh, chapter 12, or, or chapter 36, I'm sorry, in Second Chronicles. Let's take a pause. Let's get back to Second Chronicles. Zedekiah is in mind here, and we have that at verse 11. So Zedekiah was 21 years old. I want to read this a little bit slower. He was 21 years old when he became king. And he reigned for 11 years in Jerusalem. Here's the problem, of course. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God, did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke by the mouth of the Lord. Remember, he, we just read what Jeremiah had said to him. It says also in verse 13 that he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear an oath by God, but he stiffened his neck, hardened his heart against turning to the Lord of Israel. So when he was 
left with a decision and Nebuchadnezzar made him do something or gave him no options, he would not repent. He wouldn't come back to the Lord. Let me give you some references on this. Um, the, the history on this, Ezekiel records it after the fact. That's found in chapter 17, uh, verse 15 of Ezekiel. But if we go to 2 Kings, these are the, the parallels. Um, and it runs uh, chapter 24, starting at verse 17 through chapter 25, verse 10, I believe it is. Um, yeah, verse 10. You can read through this and you'll see that that's the parallel where you get more detail given about this. So this is where Nebuchadnezzar gives him the ultimatum and tells him what he's supposed to do. And there is that rebellion that really leads to the consequence. So um, that's where we get to then verse 14. So from Josiah to this point in the history, like I've said, is around 20 years, a little bit more. So that's all the time that it took to get to this place where they're taken away finally and from that time when Josiah had things and the nation was prospering and doing well under a man who was godly, who cared deeply about the things of the Lord on a personal level and also on behalf of the nation. And this is the difference when you have somebody as the head of your nation who honors God on a personal level and really requires it as lots of commotion downstairs, requires it very much of the people. In this case, that was not that was not the case um, with uh, with the rest of the people and with this king. By the time that Josiah is gone, there is a real, real problem with these kings that that follow after him. And twenty years later, this is where they've come. This is how bad it's become. So, verse fourteen. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people also transgressed more and more, according to all of the abomination of the nations. They defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Just think about that. It went from Josiah reestablishing everything. Look at what we left off with last week. Just read chapter 35. And here's your contrast. 20 years later, they defiled the temple that had been rebuilt under Josiah. And it, the, the understanding that God was ready to judge them was not unknown to them. So the idea that this, this somehow in just 20 years has gone to the total opposite direction after Josiah had died. Again, 20 years may seem like a long time, but for an entire nation to go from a place of prosperity and honoring God to a place of being servants and being subjected to a foreign nation and completely uh, d displaced, uh, ultimately, it just is, it's almost unimaginable that it could happen so quickly. And I am reminded by just looking at my country in the time that I've been alive, it's more than 20 years that I've seen in the degradation. But if I just back up the clock from 2022 to 2002, it's gone a long way. It's fallen apart tremendously in that amount of time. And where we are currently is just unimaginable and getting worse by the day. Again, my hope is not in this world, so that's where I find solace and I find comfort. Now, in verses 15 and 16, let's remember that uh, the two most prominent of the, uh, the prophets that you can read about, there are chapter after chapter after chapter from Jeremiah speaking about this. But Zephaniah is, again, kind of pound for pound, if you will, says some of the most important things that you'll find spoken to the nation of Judah and if you try to say that the church is never going to be Judah, but the same things that Judah was doing, I see we also are, are seeing it happen in the church today of not honoring God as they should. They're supposed to be God's people, but they're not acting like it. So um, the idea that God could say, I'm not going to prosper what you're doing and I'll let you go away into judgment. We're not a nation that's going to be taken away in the same way that, that Israel was or Judah. But still the same thing about how the prophets and the princes and the priests and those people that are in that place of leadership had completely abandoned God. And so there was only one you know, remedy or one thing left for the people, and that was God's judgment. And boy, our, our country, though we're not a covenant nation, we are a people in which many people who are Bible-believing Christians have to endure the wickedness of our government, and we have to live 
with the consequences of, I believe, God very much removing his hand of blessing from this nation that we once enjoyed. So I'm recording this in June of 2022. Just take a look around at what's happened in just the last year. It's profound. So with that being said, let's read verses 15 through uh, 15 and 16, because there is something in here that is just staggering when you read it. So it says, Now the Lord God of their fathers, he sent warnings to them by his messengers. Again, Zephaniah, great example. Jeremiah and all he had to say from the time of the pronouncing of the judgments, perfect example. And, um, and it says, um, The Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early, sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. What an amazing thing. It's not that they deserved it, but it's because of who he is and who they were supposed to be in him. And so God sends messengers. What can I do to get through to you the importance of this? Now, God knows that they're not going to listen, but that is not the reason he sends. He sends them. Yeah, he wants them to turn, but he knows that they won't. So this becomes then a matter of accountability. They will not be able to plead ignorance. They are going to be responsible for their wickedness. That's the important part. Verse 16. They... Uh, but they mocked these messengers of God. They despised his words, not the messengers, but the, the words of the Lord spoken by the messengers. So their problem was a rebellion against God, and ultimately the messengers were just the in-between. And so it says they despised the words. They scoffed at the prophets until what? Until the wrath of the Lord rose against the people and until there was no remedy. Let that sink in, because I read it, I know exactly what it's saying, but it's still hard for me to fully digest that something can be so unbelievably wicked that all remedial possibilities are now removed. That is, awe, I'm awestruck when I read that. And I wonder, when does a nation actually get to that point? That they have so provoked God that there really is no remedy left. Now, does that mean that there are no godly people? Well, we know that there's Zephaniah. We know that there's Jeremiah. There are others who, who uh, were prophets, and there were, there were people who obviously honored God. But they were in such a minority that it was nothing to do with the, the kings and the princes and the, seemingly even the priests. And there, weren't, there just was nothing there of a way of honoring God in a national sense. And so, unfortunately, the godly people had to suffer the consequences that are created by the ungodly people. And I fully appreciate what that means in our day and age, because I see it all around us. It's not a great time to be a, quote, believer and a Christian. Um, we're beginning to be more marginalized and hated by the world if we're biblical Christians. You can call yourself a Christian all day long, but not live it and not know what it even means. But for those people who genuinely, would, I guess we would put it this way, if we have made God's priorities our priorities, not that we're perfect, but if the things that grieve his heart grieve ours, if the things that are an offense to him are an offense to us, that puts us in a really small minority, I believe, of what is the professing church. Because I can tell you some of the most morally reprehensible things that we see happening in our, our uh, country today are really not even a bother to much of the church. Either they don't pay attention to it, or in some cases, in many cases, they're participating in those exact same things. And much of the cultural stuff, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to abortion, all the rest of that stuff, the church is out to lunch on that stuff, for the most part. Biblical churches that really genuinely look at the Word of God as the authority for what they do, and they spend time in the Word so that they can be, you know, have God reveal to, him, to them what He wants of them, they're going to be different from the, the modern church as we see it. But most people that claim to be Christians and most churches that claim to be Christian churches are clueless when it comes to the scriptures. Sad thing. So, again, just let that let that sit there in your mind. They Notice the things. It says that they mocked the messengers, despised the word of God, scoffed at his prophets, until God's wrath came upon them, and until there was no remedy. There was just no way of fixing this. Now, that's not because God couldn't fix it. It's that there was no remedy because no one was seeking remedy. God is always able 
every time, the repentant heart that cries out to God will always be heard. At this point, the repentant hearts would have just surrendered to the Babylonians, and they were going to have to deal with the captivity. Let's make sure that we remember this, too, because this is a good place to remember for those people that say, well, why do good people have to suffer? Well, it depends on where you're living in this case, and sometimes even in our case. Why are the, the Christians having to suffer right alongside of the wicked people? Or why were the godly people having to suffer under the, the horrible leadership of the kings of Judah? And unfortunately, this is just the, the fallout of a broken, rebellious creation and the sin of man that creates such misery for other men. And so our promises are not anything good in this life. Our promises are in, in eternity. If we're going to say, when will, when will these things make, you know, when will they be corrected? I don't have any hope in this world, and I haven't for a very, very long time. If there are any good things that happen in our nation, then that's just because God's giving us extra time. But my, my allegiance is not to this world. My allegiance is to the one that is to come that's secured for me, for me through the person of Jesus. So, chapter 17, or I'm sorry, verse 17 of 2 Chronicles 36. Therefore, he, meaning God, he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword, in the house of their sanctuary, and he had no compassion on the young men or the virgin, on the aged or the weak, he gave them all into his hand. So God said, hand of protection off. Remember, you've already been warned, if you remain and try to put up a fight, when they come in to conquer, none of you will be spared. Read Zephaniah 3, chapter 2 and chapter 3. Heavy, heavy stuff. Remember, God's already said, get out while you can, because if you don't, when they come in, you're going to be wiped out. And this is exactly what took place. And it says, all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king and of the leaders, these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all of its palaces with fire, destroyed its precious possessions, and those who escaped from the sword he then carried to Babylon, that meaning Nebuchadnezzar, where they became servants to him and to his sons uh, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. So that helps you to understand how far into all of this this was being written. This has already taken place from the perspective of the writer. <clears throat> he's talking about what took place, but he's having to take into account the time that they were in the captivity, which was the 70 years. And it talks about even speaking of Persia, but really when, when this was, the events that are taking place happened at the hands of the Babylonians. The Babylonians were captured or conquered by the Persians. And so all of that is already a historical event when the writing of Chronicles takes place. So with all of that being said, there are some really significant parts to this because we've been told they're, they're being taken away to Babylon. And we need to remember also that in real time, um, there were things that Jeremiah was saying to them. And we're going to read a couple of those. When Jeremiah says what he says, the events have not yet taken place. But God not only tells them they're going to take place soon, he even tells them how long they're going to last. That is a significant, significant thing. It's an amazing thing that's said here. So it says this, that he, in verse 21, that he did all this to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths as long as she lay desolate she kept the Sabbaths to fulfill 70 years. That is an explanation as to why the 70 years was necessary. So if we ask ourselves, okay, they're taken away by Babylon, but why was it 70 years and why was it so specific? We're told right here the reason for it, and it's taken from Leviticus 25 and into 26. In particular, let me give you the reference for it. Um, in Leviticus, it is... Um, Leviticus 26, verse 34 to 43, is the consequence. Actually, all of chapter 26 is hugely important. 25 and 26 historically for this. Because God had said there's going to be a year of letting the land rest, the seventh year. And so let the land rest. Don't do anything to it. And it'll still yield for you. Put away what you need to, but don't till the land. Let the land alone for an entire year. 
And we've realized that they have not done that for a, a, a cycle of 70 cycles, 70 times 7, 490 years. That's a very significant you know, uh, time when we start to think about Daniel and his 70 weeks and the 490 years of that too. So these numbers of sevens and seventies, you see it throughout scriptures and uh, th throughout the scriptures, and it's a fascinating one. But God says every seventh year you're supposed to give the land rest according to uh, Leviticus 26, and uh, the passage I cited for you was at 34, starting at verse 34. Um, um, yeah, 34 to 43. So God says. You're going to give the land rest. They, did, they didn't do it. So for 70 of those cycles on that seventh year, 70 times in a row, they did not give the land rest. So God says, you violated my law according to Leviticus, first of all. But second of all, you're also so incredibly wicked. I am going to judge you for that. The length of your judgment is based upon the generations. It's gone on for almost 500 years that you have not given the land rest as the law requires you to give. And remember that law was given to them before they ever came into the land. So pretty much for the whole time that they were in the land, until this time, they had not been doing what they were supposed to do. So on 70 occasions, they did not give the land rest on that, 70th, uh, on that seventh interval. So this is what tells us the length of that captivity. So... The, uh, the fulfillment of the word of the Lord. Let's look at some of those examples, and we're going to go back to Jeremiah, and we're going to go to chapter 25 for the first one of these. So, this runs verses 1 through 13, so I'll just read it. The word of the, the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. So as he comes on to the ascendancy, it's early on after Josiah, and here's what's so, said to him. Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and here's what he said. From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, there is the twenty-third year in which the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken it to you, rising early in speaking, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you all of his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But you have not listened, nor have you inclined your ear to hear. Thus said, uh, they said rather, repent now every one of his evil and from his evil doings and dwell in the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods to serve them, to worship them. Do not provoke me to anger with your works of your hands, and it will be, uh, and I then will not harm you. They could not plead ignorance. In fact, that is the entirety of Jeremiah's ministry. Some people would look at that and say, why would God ask Jeremiah to do all of these things when nobody was going to listen to him? It's accountability. That's why. So this is why it's important for us in our days to make sure that we are careful to proclaim the, the truth and the genuine gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that day will come when people will have to stand before the Lord and we want them to be accountable. And hopefully in that accountability, they'll come to their senses. Some did, clearly. But as a nation, by and large, the people in the overwhelming, what must be overwhelming majority, rejected God even in the face of all of the threat. So look at what it says, verse 7. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands and with your own heart. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will uh, send and take all the families of the north, um, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and he will bring them against this land, against the inhabitants, against these nations all around, and I will utterly destroy them. Make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from the uh, voice of, of mirth and uh, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the uh, millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and the nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years." So he was told, or they were told through him, and he repeats it. Does, he says it more than once. 
tells them it's going to be 70 years. We've just studied in Chronicles that tells us the reason for the 70 years. Now, verse 12, when it, comes, uh, when it will come to pass, when 70 years are then completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I will also bring on that land all of my words which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book, and Jeremiah has prophesied concerning the nations. What an interesting thing. So it's not as though Nebuchadnezzar is a righteous man. It's not that the nation is righteous. It's that Ju Judah is wicked, and God is going to use a wicked nation to take them and, and put them into their captivity for reasons that he desires. But it doesn't mean that in, in the things that they've done that they're not also going to be judged. God is not mocked. So, from there, we turn to chapter 27. Look what we read in chapter 27, and we'll read uh, verses 1 to 11 here. So, the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord to me, Make for yourself bonds and yokes, and put them on your neck. Now, I mock the idea of the modern preacher and all of the props that they put up on stage. I just look at that stuff sometimes and I just go, the circus that is the modern church just makes me want to vomit. And so I, whenever I see props and these big mega churches do this just because it's so entertaining and people just lap this garbage up, they have props all the time. So whatever their, you know, their 10-week sermon series on whatever, they've got props up on stage. And I've really done that. I've mocked it a lot. There's a time when God actually had him use props. So I got to be careful. There are those times when God will do so. Well, thus says the Lord to me, make for yourself bonds and yokes and put them on your neck and then send them to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre and the king of Sidon uh, by the hand of the messengers who came to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, the king of Judah. So <clears throat> this is tell all the surrounding nations. It's not just Judah that's going to have this problem. When Nebuchadnezzar comes, he's going to stomp through everybody's territory, and you're all going to be part of his. So this idea of putting yokes around them means that you're going to just be a beast of burden for, for the Babylonians. Yeah, it was a visual picture that he was saying to them, so yeah, it's a prop. Verse 4, command them to say to their masters, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, thus you will say to your masters, I have made the earth the man and the beast that are on the ground, and my, by my great power and my outstretched arm, and I have given it to whom I uh, seemed proper, who it seemed proper to me. So you're going to be subjected to Nebuchadnezzar, but just realize I put him in that position, no one else. I Everything belongs to me. I'm just making it a day of reckoning, and everybody's going to have that day of reckoning. This whole part of the world is going to have that day of reckoning. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field I also have given him to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his son's sons until the time that the land comes, uh, of his land comes, and then many nations and great kings will make uh, him and uh, make him serve them. It's going to turn the other way around. Nebuchadnezzar will become the vassal, or not Nebuchadnezzar, but Babylon will be. And it shall be that the nation and the kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put uh, its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that that nation I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and uh, that I have consumed uh, them by his hand. Therefore... Do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, and your sorcerers who speak to you saying you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they pro uh, prophesy a lie to you to remove you far from your hand or from your land, and uh, I will drive you out and your and you will perish. But the nations that bring their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon to serve him, I will let them remain in their own land, says the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell in it. Now, the last of these is a really, really important one, and here's why. Because so often, this passage that I'm about to read to you is applied to the church, and people, you know, make their 
bumper stickers out of it or their shirts out of it or the churches preach on it as though it's being written to the church. This passage I'm about to read to you is not written to the church. It is written specifically not to Israel as a whole. It is written to Judah. It is written to the nation that's about to go away in its captivity. And remember, when you read this and when you hear it, if you don't already know it, you will recognize it because you've probably heard it said by so many people applying it to the church. It doesn't apply to the church. You can find plenty of places in the New Testament that say similar things, but let's leave the passages that are specifically written to Jerusalem or to Judah or to Israel, to the children of Israel. Let's leave those things. If they are specifically written to them, leave them alone. So, chapter 29 of Jeremiah and we read in verse 10, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and I will perform my good word toward you, and I will cause you to return to this place. So here's where it's going to become familiar, but notice he's already said 70 years. That's going to be the beginning. Zerubbabel is going to come, but it will be a few decades before you see Ezra and Nehemiah. Nehemiah first, Ezra after him. For, look at this, verse 11. We're all familiar with this passage, but it's not to us and it's not to the church. It's to them. I can find New Testament passages that say a very similar thing, but quoting this verbatim to the church is just folly. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. They are thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and you will go and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away. So, very obvious what's being said here. And um, so we'll, we'll just kind of leave that because I'm, I know that we're starting to run short on time. This passage here is very clearly said to them, and he mentions the 70 years. That means that even before those 70 years, if people were crying out to him, Lord, we repent, we're so sorry, genuine heartfelt, would you return us? God would have to say, the, the heart and the sentiment's great, and I'll, I'll be with you, and you'll have fellowship with me, but you can't return to your place because it still is on time out. Because you would not give it rest from you, I'm giving, or you wouldn't give it rest, I'm giving it a rest from you. That's the 70 years. So with that being said, let's go back to um, 2 Chronicles 36, and we'll finish this out. 2 Chronicles 36. So then we have this. Now, in the first year of, the, of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom, and he also put it in writing. And here is what, um, what he records. Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth of the Lord, uh, that the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of, of all of his people. May the Lord his God be with you and let him go up. Let's take a look at Isaiah. And this is, again, almost 200 years before Cyrus is born. And look at how, how accurate this is. Chapter 44. The last verse of it is verse 28, where it says... Who says of Cyrus, God speaking, he is my shepherd? He shall perform my pleasure, says, uh, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. And uh, to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 45, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and to loose the armor of kings to open before him double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you, and I will make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze, and I will cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I am the Lord, who call you by your name. I am the God of Israel, 
For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect, I have even called you by your name, and I have named you, though you have not known me. Imagine the first time he read that. That is some pretty amazing stuff. Now, I hear the scoffers about this whole thing. Well, of course, that's that, that's just written after the fact. Okay, well, that's one explanation. Uh, if your God is so small that he only fits in the pages of a book, but the God that I know of and, and the one who uh, spoke these things, if time is something that he can see all of it from the beginning to the end at the same time in the end of the beginning, if he sees it all played out in front of him in real time all that time, he has no problems picking out what's going to happen along that timeline. we got to stop thinking that he's like us, that moment by moment things are revealed to him. Time is something that we're stuck in. He's outside of time. He sees all of it simultaneously. So when he's able to say this, he can look down the road 200 years, and he's going to say, I'm going to use that guy to bring my people back after they have completed their penalty, if you will, for the things that they have done and even the length of time. And then I will bring my people back. So naming him by name, that was done for us, those people who believe the Bible, because we can say, if he can say something like that and have it be accurate, I can trust him for everything going forward that he has said. It also served as a reason for the people there at that time to understand that God would tell them beforehand. And when those things happened, God would say about that, who can tell the things as I tell them? That before they spring to life, I have told you about them. That's a chapter 42, and uh, it's just one of those things where God just rewrites everything uh, of people's understanding. He just tells them over and over again about things that are going to be coming to pass. So with that, we close out Second Chronicles. It really sets up nicely because Ezra is the next in the uh, of the books that we'll study. This is after their 70 years and after the initial part of Zerubbabel. Now Ezra comes back and he's going to reestablish in that place um, the formal worship. Though Nehemiah is after him, Nehemiah came first. It was reassembling the walls and making it fortified again. And then Ezra comes in. So again, it's not necessarily chronological, but it will kind of deal with that same era of time because uh, both uh, Nehemiah and Ezra are contemporaries and uh, they are during that, that uh, Babylonian and then into the Persian captivity. They were born in that foreign place, but they come back to the place of their origin to reestablish things as they should be. So uh, we'll pick up there next week. And that's a lot of information, a lot of detail. If there's anything that I've covered in this that uh, you would like more information about, please, again, contact me through the church, or the I keep saying church, the ministry's website, which is oldpaththeology.net, and send me an email. I'll be happy to answer any questions that come up, and uh, we will pick up at Ezra next week. Mm -hmm.